Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about Intergifted? Yes, so Intergifted is celebrating our eighth year of community and our organization this year. Um, I started Intergifted in 2015 after um, a number of years of dedicating my, my efforts as a psychologist and coach to gifted adults. And gifted adults were telling me, all my clients were telling me, please, you've got to connect us with each other. And one thing led to another. I've told the story in other contexts. Um, so it's a public story. People can and can learn about it on, on podcasts and on our website. But uh, one thing led to another. And I started this online community, International Online Community for Gifted Adults. So um, eight years later, we have 800 plus people in the community. And we, um, we you know, connect on all kinds of things, self-development and giftedness awareness and giftedness integration as a gifted adult. Um, and we, along the years, we have um, grown to have a, a large group of coaches who offer coaching for gifted adults. And I've developed a model of giftedness, which we might talk about uh, during our call here, um, which is a holistic model and uh, looking at six different areas of intelligence and not just intellectual intelligence. So that model has then become a basis for doing qualitative assessments where we help gifted adults really understand the unique gifted pro giftedness profile. And in addition to that, then I have started to train uh, gifted therapists and coaches around the world to understand how to work with their gifted clients. So those are my gifted psychology courses. And uh, that's become quite popular. And that I think we're on our maybe 15th group or something. Um, they're, they're pretty long trainings and quite popular. There's probably uh, more in our thing, but that's a, that gives a good. Yeah. Yeah. Th oh, yeah. Thank you. And, and Emily and I have been reading uh, your blogs online and we've been on the Intergifted website and and really enjoying what we're reading. And it's really strikes home with us as gifted adults, too. And so maybe if you wouldn't mind, just kind of start talking a little bit about the model of giftedness that you mentioned. And if you don't mind, we might interrupt you here and there with some with some questions. Well, the model came out of my fascination with um, neuroscience and obviously psychology, my clinical work, um, but also consciousness studies and the study of the development of personality. So it was not um, just interest in, you know, high accomplishment or something. It was really interested in how the brain works. What is the what is existence in general? Um, what is consciousness? And that really gave me this idea of you know, I, I need a, a really holistic model that encompasses everything and not just not just IQ score um, or not just logical mathematical intelligence, you know. So um, through my study of Dabrowski and his theory of positive disintegration and the five overexcitabilities and all the rest of what I just mentioned, I, I worked, you know, toward this model and um, it looks at six areas of intelligence. So we start with intellectual because we're talking about intellectual giftedness plus whatever flavors come with it. So that can be um, emotional, existential, creative, uh, uh, physical, and sensual areas of intelligence. So really the whole mind, body, spirit, if you want to include that word, <laughs> you know, the mm -hmm. whole the whole person. Um, and that uh, that includes the interpersonal aspects as well, especially through the emotional intelligence. I, you had mentioned uh, in some of your writing that as a psychological coach, you've witnessed a, a lot of adults come to understand more about giftedness in themselves and that there's a sort of a predictable pattern that follows discovering their own giftedness. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, giftedness discovery as an adult is kind of a new-ish thing. It just wasn't something that people were talking about a whole lot before. Um, maybe realizing you have a high IQ and maybe joining Mensa or something that, that was not so uncommon before, but really embracing the idea of a holistic gifted self and gifted specific needs and gifted development, that was just, it's that was not really um, on the table and it's become more common. And as we grow the field of gifted psychology, adult gifted psychology, it becomes more and more common, obviously as um, material is out there that, that people can start to recognize themselves in. 
And um, so a lot of times people will, you know, learn about the, the characteristics of a gifted adult, and then they'll say, oh my God, that describes me. And there's like kind of that un initial euphoria, like, oh, wow, okay, this kind of excitement, like, um, wow, this describes me, this opens up a million doors. Um, and then, you know, one gets excited and, and maybe goes and starts to tell their family, tell their partner, tell their friends. And, mm -hmm. you know, other people maybe aren't so receptive or don't know what they're talking about. Or sometimes people say, yeah, well, obviously you're gifted. So why are we even bothering to talk mm -hmm. about it? And so there can be this kind of next phase of like the, you know, the anger, like why doesn't society accept me? Or why didn't, why didn't I know this all along? This would have changed everything. Um, you know, and I didn't mention all of this could also be preceded by denial because some people just can live in denial about it for a long time. So even if they're recognizing themselves on the list, um, maybe they're saying, yeah, but who am I to think? I mean, imposter syndrome can play mm -hmm. a big part of it. Shame can play a big part of it. Cultural norms and, and you know, like if you, um, if you know that nobody's going to accept of, uh, giftedness or if you come from a culture where it's very bad to be gifted and you're not going to fit in you're not going to get any support well then maybe you know you'll stay in that denial phase but if you come out of the denial phase and you, you you're in the excitement phase then that anger can come up it very often does come up because when you start to realize like wow i can embrace this side of myself um you realize you haven't been able to embrace it all along maybe because you didn't know or because of school the way that things were in the education system or um, again, the cultural factors or family factors. Uh, and then, you know, then I wrote about this on the blog. Uh, so, you know, people who are watching can go and, and read about this, but uh, it kind of, in a way there are some, it follows the Kubler-Ross stages of grief, you know, a little bit, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a little bit of commonality there and um, it can go to a kind of bargaining, like, you know, to the powers that be, please, please let this not be so, let me not be so different. Let me not be such an outlier or kind of this moment where we really want the world to be different than it is. And we don't want to have to face the challenges that are going to come with, I, you know, taking on this new identity because we might have to have uncomfortable conversations. We may have to kick some people out of our lives if they're really against it. We may have to advocate for ourselves at work or in personal relationships in ways that are really uncomfortable. So um, we can have this bargaining phase where we're like, okay, I wanna keep the giftedness, but please don't make me do the, all that other stuff, you know? Um, but then we work through it, especially if you have support along the way, and then you come to that acceptance. Okay, this is how it is. The world is how it is, and my brain is how it is. And so how can I, what can, what's the best I can do here? So then comes a phase of, you know, like active rebuilding. And a lot of times that's just like figuring out um, how to advocate and, you know, meeting those basic gifted needs that maybe you didn't know about in all of the years that you didn't know you were gifted or that you were in denial that you were gifted. Um, and then once a, you have a stable foundation, then then kind of this emergent creativity can come out. Mm -hmm. And that's where when we're thinking about and we're working with people through their what we call their giftedness integration, we're really looking at how do we bring all these different fragments back together, the different fragments that people were ashamed of or that education pushed out of them or that, um, you know, parenting or trauma pushed out. How do we bring all of these things back together so that the person's unique creativity mm -hmm. can emerge from from their holistic gift itself? And that's a beautiful phase, but it takes a lot of work to get to. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's worth the work. I always tell people it's worth the work it may not feel like it's worth the work during some of these other phases, anger, bargaining, and so on, but it is worth the work. Thank you. I'm curious to know, is um, the book that you have published on Intergifted, These Gifts Are Sacred, is that project born out of some of the clients you've worked with that have really successfully integrated themselves yeah. with the emergent creativity? Yeah, I think... When I think about that um, that book, which for for anyone uh, watching, that's an anthology of poetry, com contemplative poetry on giftedness, giftedness discovery, the experience of being an adult gifted person, um, you know, what it's like to sort of embrace 
giftedness and, and live with it. And um, I find that this book really embodies what we've built over the eight years of our community. Uh, and it does really, as you're saying, Emily, it really does represent the wholeness, this idea of wholeness that we can grow into, where we have this emergent creativity and it's not all achievement focused and it's not all um, education focused and it's not all productivity focused, but it, it's like bringing all of these parts of ourselves back together, the playful parts, the creative parts, the parts that need to experience joy and awe on a daily basis, mm -hmm. gratitude, mindfulness, um, all of these things that make us whole beings, but which, you know, dominant cultural norms have made questionable or sometimes even dangerous, you know? And so we're like in the business of sort of reclaiming the wholeness, but through a really active stance, you know, it's not just saying that this is all unfair and the whole world should just be different. It's like, how do we create the different world um, through the you know through the coming together of the different parts that we've we've hidden away it's a really like a collective project i mean it's a collective thing we do together uh we heal together and we 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 bring that wholeness back together and that provides sort of a culture like a safe safety net like a safety social culture thing uh you know like a almost like a force field where mm -hmm. um people can come and see what it's like and see what that feels like and develop that themselves. It's still, there's still like a radical response, self-responsibility issue to it. Like nobody can come in and then the healing is done for them. They still have to, you know, go through their own healing, but, and, and that reclaiming, you know, of the full gift itself. But isn't that a million times easier to do when you're in a space where people are doing it and have done it and you have mentors and um, elders and role models and people that you can look to that mirror, you know, your path back to you uh, in an empowering way and that don't leave any parts out that don't leave the non, uh, the, don't, that don't leave the gifted parts out because that's what a lot of people find and, you know, sort of regular social situations that aren't gifted specific is like, yeah, they might get, great mirroring for certain parts but the other parts are you know they're having to check themselves at the door and not come in so yeah, yeah. to answer your question yeah. yes the, that book That's is beautiful <laughs> yeah it's truly it, uh, a, a representation of what we do and why we do it yeah yeah and yeah. the cool thing is to your question as well uh, a lot of the contributors they've been in our community from the beginning mm -hmm. and they've really mm -hmm. grown into their own gifted leadership and so for me it's really rewarding to you know to see like it's almost like we have these generations of of gifted leaders that are stepping up and and showing their their full gifted self and it's really powerful to see thank you in in your blog in in your articles and in, in your blog uh, you write about this understanding of one's giftedness almost like reclaiming your childhood and yeah. reclaiming phases during your childhood. And uh, that's a very powerful thought. That's a very powerful way to think about it. Talks about how, how deeply understandings and misunderstandings are in our lives. Could you talk a little bit about that, the reclaiming the childhood through understanding one's own giftedness? Yeah, it's such a beautiful process difficult like I'm saying it is difficult and it is hard work at times but it's such a beautiful process um you know as we go through childhood if there are parts of ourselves that aren't welcomed by our, our our surroundings um and and sometimes it's not even that it's not like overtly welcome it's sometimes it's just that it's like we all know if we talk about this topic with that person they're going to stay quiet or they're not going to ask any mm -hmm. follow-up questions or they're not going to show any mm -hmm. interest so it's not like they're forbidding us to talk about that topic it's just they don't bring it up or um like if we're a gifted kid and we have a lot of curiosity about let's say the stars um and astronomy and um nobody ever talks to us about that nobody gives us a telescope nobody shows any interest well and and if we ask for it that you know the answer is no or something then we just close that part down you know it's really when we think about um you know neuroscience the brain does close down it shuts i mean it's it stops mm. the neuronal connections uh, of areas that are not being used and so 
um, it's not that the energy goes away, it just, it just gets put into something else. So a lot of times we'll find that we have like neglected parts that um, don't get that proper developmental mirror and, and context. And so they just kind of stay quiet. And I don't think, at least in my experience, it's not like it goes away forever. It just kind of stays dormant and it could be reawakened. There is that potential there. It could be reawakened. I mean, once you're older, it's never going to be the exact same as, you know, when you're two or three, but, um, but the, the pathways, the potential pathways are there and the basic building blocks are there if there's energy put into, you know, let's say re reconnecting those, that the, those neural neuronal, neuronal nets. So, um, so we can do this work where as gifted adults, we look back at our childhood and we, we ask ourselves, were my gifted specific developmental needs met adequately? And we can look, you know, maybe, some, maybe some were, some weren't, depends on the different developmental stages. I use Eric Erickson's developmental stages in my work to talk about the second childhood, you know, going through the different uh, phases um, or stages and, you know, asking these questions like, does my gifted life matter? Does my gifted self, is my gifted self safe? Um, all of these kinds of questions that can come with the gifted self and the development of the gifted self, these, these existential questions that kind of help us to feel safe in this world and be whole, as I'm describing, and not have fragmented parts. So as we look at those stages and evaluate, were they met? A lot of times we see areas where they just weren't met adequately. And that can be experienced as benign neglect, or that can be experienced as real trauma, because sometimes, um, you know, our surroundings were actually um, like adverse to that the existence of that part of ourselves. So that can be through gaslighting, that can be through abuse, that can be through, um, you know, like malignant neglect, not just benign neglect. If it's more of the benign style, then there's usually less pain associated with the fact that those needs didn't get met. It's kind of like, oh yeah, it sucks those needs didn't get met, but okay, I can meet them now. And it's not such like a big emotional project, but when it's when it's really more, you know, on the trauma side of things, um, when somebody really experienced that people were trying to prevent them from you know the, the child or prevent our child selves from meeting its needs its gifted specific needs that's when it's something that I call gifted trauma and um and that's yeah that makes it a much more emotional process to get through a lot of times we need support to to get through that um, because we have to experience the safety for our gifted selves our young gifted selves to our young gifted self or selves to um to know that it's okay to express those things. And like I was saying before, to have somebody who's interested and to have somebody who provides resources, uh, because a lot of times those parts of ourselves are just frozen. And like, when we look at the brain science of it, it's like, the, it's like frozen in the midbrain, you know, area. So it's not even like the, it's not like, oh, well, I'm just, I'm so smart. Um, I can just tell my midbrain what to do and it's all, everything's going to be great. It's like, I can tell my midbrain all day, but it doesn't, respond to intellectual giftedness like I can I can know all the answers and this is like one of the problems that often comes up come up for comes up for um gifted adults in therapy is that the therapist will say well I mean you understand your problem so well like what else could what else could we do for you maybe you're done with therapy because you understand your problem so well you can articulate them you can analyze them you have all the answers um but the gifted person's like yeah, I have all the answers, but I still feel terrible or I still am not able to get those those needs met or I'm still feeling profound shame or something like that. And that's because of these they're working in different parts of the brain. So it's not um, it's not so easy. You can't just intellectually know all of this stuff and it magically happens. It's really a whole pro like mind, body, spirit process that one goes through uh, evaluating these needs, seeing where they haven't been met, getting the right support and then fulfilling them now as much as can be done. So a lot of times that can look like um, a person sort of going backwards instead of going forwards. It can look like simplifying one's life, um, changing focus, reevaluating what's important. So sometimes it can be like somebody is 
totally successful out in the world, according to the you know stereotypical narrative of the genius or something. And then maybe they take a break. They take a break from all the earnings. They take a break from, you know, being the multitasker, brilliant at everything. Take a break and they go to therapy or they take some time away or they go, I don't know, to a meditation retreat and um, and just decide to not focus so much on those external things and instead focus on their inner process. A lot of times I use the model of Dabrowski's positive disintegration to describe what's happening at that time. It's like a phase where a person says, okay, I built up a life based on a narrative about myself that actually was fragmented and it was it's built on, you know, on a structural fragmentation. And so um, I am going to take the time to take down what is built on that and then understand my wholeness and, and heal the things that that have caused the fragmentation and then build back up. Usually after, you know, that phase, the, 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 the focus is not so much on accomplishment or being the best or whatever. Um, that might be a side effect of what the person does anyway. You know, a gifted person is a powerful person no matter what, right? So um, it might be that they end up accomplishing a lot and that they're very powerful and, and um, you know, very successful, but that's usually not the first focus. It's usually, the first focus is um, authentic self-expression, wholeness, making a positive difference in, in their own life and in the, in the lives of those around. Um, so it's interesting, you can have kind of this, a similar outcome externally, but it comes from somewhere so different internally. Yeah. You you describe this dysfunctional relationship that adults can have with productivity. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, the myth of the genius who are who's just like perfect and um, their intelligence is going to make them take over the world and it's just going to be so great. And in a meritocracy, mm -hmm. you know, the harder you work, the more grit you have, the more you're going to accomplish. So the narrative can... Um, just be so sort of fixed, like a fixed path. Okay, got to go down that path where this is how my intelligence is going to be used because that's what's valued by society. And um, when we can look at that differently, we can look at the potential. So that's a narrative of a potential for success, worldly success. But then you can look at the as a narrative of the potential for thriving. And then the question is, is are those the same thing? right? Personal thriving and worldly success, is that the same thing? Like I said before, it could be, but usually if that's the case, um, if you can have them both together, it's that there's thriving as the, you know, holistic thriving as the main point, as the main goal, and then the others kind of emerge from that. Um, and that's what I like to see because it means that somebody is really fulfilled from the inside. I mean, I've worked with countless people over the years that are brilliant and they're accomplishing so much, but they're so empty inside and they're struggling with depression, shame, imposter syndrome, existential crises, existential depression, um, feeling like if I just accomplished more, you know, I write about on the on the blog, I write about uh, um, one of my clients has who had two PhDs and was, you know, telling himself that he needed to do more. It was never enough. And, you know, me asking him, okay, well, what is your, you know, what is your definition of the good life? And his response is all about work, work, work and get more done. And, you know, and that that's no way to live. That's no way to sort of enjoy one's gift. He had no space for enjoyment of his own gifts. So, mm -hmm. you know, working on, um, the development of of space first of all to to be able to look at all of this and self reflection and getting out of the like i said the cultural narratives that giftedness should result in something you know perfect or the best or whatever like our world doesn't i mean our world doesn't have enough space and resources for everybody to be the best it doesn't make sense like we can't all stand on each other's heads you know it's like mm -hmm. um but that's that can be the feeling that can feel like the pressure that a lot of people feel like i just have to keep going i have to keep climbing and climbing um and then feeling that terrible angst inside at the same time 
-hmm. Thank you for the image of standing on each other's heads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I see, I see a a, a new uh, collaborative poem coming from that. <laughs> With that is the image. <laughs> Yeah, it is how it feels like it is how I see it when people are talking, you know, like, got to get ahead. I got to go, go, go. And I'm thinking, well, that's that's, you know, from your perspective, maybe that might feel good if you're not paying attention to what's going on below you. But I mean, you live in this world that's below you and you want to belong to it. Right. Mm. You know, so because that's nice. a big problem that comes with that, that a person feels like they never belong. I mean, how can you belong when you're just standing on everybody's head? Right. Like it doesn't. <laughs> You don't know yeah, it's a good that's a that's a good image of the world below that that's what you're connected to that's what you want to be connected to yeah um our time has gone so fast already yeah, we're, it we're getting down toward the end however you know i want to i want to uh at least one more question and you talked about the feeling how important it is to feel that your gifted self is safe and if, if if an adult were to come to you with that question, with that problem, that my gifted self does just does not feel safe. I mean, where do you go with that? If that's how you feel, where do you go with that? What do you do? What's your first step? Where, wh what would you recommend? Yeah, we always recommend when a person can afford it and has the time to be able to do it. We recommend going to therapy with a gifted specific therapist. So this has to be somebody who is either themselves gifted and has studied it or um, who is maybe is not gifted, but t is willing to take the time to understand what giftedness is. There are obviously some important things that can be mirrored by a gifted therapist that won't be mirrored in the same way by a non-gifted therapist. Um, that said, you know, if, if you have a person that is willing to make space for your giftedness, even if they can't mirror it exactly, you know, mirror it because of their own experience, that's still really powerful. So I tell people sometimes they'll say, I can't, I haven't been able to find a gifted specific therapist. Should I just wait? Should I just give up on therapy? No, go to a non-gifted therapist um, who is open to your gifted experience. So that when I say open to the gifted experience, I mean, you know, they're willing to take some time to read about it, to learn about it, and willing to listen to you about your own experience. Because a lot of the problem that people that gifted people find is that they go and they're told that um that doesn't exist or everybody wants to be special in their own way or um you're just overthinking things that's your problem if you could just you know stop thinking so much then your mm -hmm. problems would yeah. be fine or fitting them into some kind of you know neuronormative box and um and then of course their gift itself is not going to be safe in that context. And so the the goal is to be working with a therapist who is not threatened by the giftedness. That isn't always so simple. Even sometimes, and I, I will say this, even sometimes with um with gifted therapists who haven't done their own giftedness integration work, uh, sometimes they can also mm -hmm. be threatened. And and so it's not just a you know guarantee if you have a a gifted therapist it's not like okay you found your perfect match for all time you still have to vet them and you still have to make sure that they've done their own integration work and it's why i do the trainings my trainings the way that i do them the professional trainings i give um because i help a, a gifted uh, professionals to go through their own giftedness self-discovery and integration process so that they can you know lead clients through it or, or accompany clients through theirs without getting triggered and without having issues come up that said, not everybody can afford therapy. And that's one of the big challenges that we find. Um, and not a bit, not, you know, there aren't so many gifted therapists yet, uh, gifted mm -hmm. therapists mm -hmm. that are knowledgeable about giftedness and that have gone through their own giftedness integration process. So um, for people like that, like I said, then we, we talk about uh, self-advocacy, figuring out your giftedness and figuring out how can you go into free spaces and and explain, okay, I'm gifted and these are my gifted specific needs and get them met as much as is possible. And there may be some free spaces that you just can't go into because your gifted self is just absolutely not going to be safe, no matter how hard you advocate, you know. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of self-education that goes into the process if you can't afford therapy. You know, all paths can lead to healing, whether mm -hmm. it's the self-leadership or leadership, you know, being led through therapy or something like that. But 
Um, they just usually take a different kind of work. I wouldn't say one takes more work than the other. They just take a different kind of work. Um, and then joining community, you know, where it's available, gifted community. Our community is really for people who are in a, in a pretty stable place and feel safe enough to, you know, be online because it's an online community. And so you have to, you have to be at a certain level of stability to be able to um, participate in an online community without getting too triggered, right? So um, so we don't always invite people into our community right away if they're really feeling unsafe. Then we say, start with therapy or start with some uh, some kind of more therapeutic process uh, or, or a community that's really like more of a support community, support group, that kind of thing. Uh, and then as you build that safety, then coming into our community or doing coaching with us or something in that direction where it's like you can, you're ready to build, right? Like build on that, but it takes some time. And as I mentioned before, you know, there can be gifted trauma, but there can also just be traumas from people's lives that make the giftedness self-discovery complex, like more, even more complex. So sometimes it's not just about, you know, feeling better about their giftedness. Sometimes they also have to, um, work on other wounds that have made them feel chronically unsafe in the world in general, you know? So it's, it's, they're tied together. And when there's both issues, the gifted wounding and the right, you know, other wounding in life, attachment wounding or something like that, obviously the, the path is more arduous and longer. Mm. Again, still worth doing the work, but, yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah. important to know that because I think some people think, well, I'm so smart. This, I should just be able to figure this all out. And being yeah. gifted doesn't make this process any faster. I mean, certain aspects, sure. But overall, yeah. I mean, doing doing healing and self-development work, it just, it's it's a big life yeah. project. Yeah. For anybody. Well, thank you so much for sharing your your advice and your insights. And, and if nothing else, just like the food for thought to grow, right? To take that next step with the, uh, with conversations with CAGT. We, we have a large gifted community in Colorado and, and yeah. a lot of people will hear your message. And so um, exponentially, we hope the growth, right? And, but thank you for all those tips and thank you for spending this time with us. Yes, uh, we're so, we're so happy that, that you could, you could be with us. Um, Jennifer, everybody, Jennifer's website, again, you'll find it inner gifted, find a number of resources there. Uh, lots of blogs, lots of readings, other resources, opportunities. Uh, I think I just saw that you were uh, forming a group real soon. Did I just see that on, I, online that you have a you have a group forming soon? I think. Uh, however, anyway, get linked up with there, um, and can people can join uh, a newsletter? Can can they do that? Yeah, yeah, we have a newsletter, and then we have our our online community. Uh, we also have courses that people can participate in, in addition to my um, courses, you know, the professional development courses for therapists and coaches. We also have other courses for gifted multi-potentialites, gifted writers, um, people who are gifted with autis autism as well. So there's all kinds of different groups and, and things that people can get involved in. And um, and yeah, there's we're all we're everywhere on social media as well. So people can follow us on Facebook and um, Instagram and LinkedIn and Twitter. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Emily. Thank you. This was delightful to be a part of this conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Mark. It's been really nice to talk to you.